excruciating pain shot through my legs. I was disoriented by the roar of a large diesel engine. My eyes strained to see a massive bumper directly over my head as a Marine Corps 5 ton was crushing my legs. My first thought? They ran over me. I can't believe they ran over me. The next? Jason, you can forget about walking across the United States. You, you will never walk again. This is the Long Journey Podcast with Jason Jamar detailing my travels across America as I share thrilling stories from my 16-month backpacking adventure from California to Maine and my eight-month kayak voyage from Maine to Texas. It begins September 20th, 1999. Elevation, sea level. Sunrise, 6.36 a.m. Sunset, 6.49 p.m. Moon phase, waxing gibbous. Location, La Jolla, San Diego, California. The morning began with breakfast at my friend's home, United States Marine Corps Sergeant Marvin Medlock. He and his family lived in San Diego, and up to three weeks ago, so did I, at least until I had completed my enlistment. Sergeant Medlock and I were both assigned to the 3rd Marine Air Wing, stationed at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. I had arrived the night before via a 37-hour ride on a Greyhound bus from my hometown of Marble Falls, Texas. Marvin put me up for the night and then drove me down to the pier at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at La Jolla, San Diego, California, so that I might begin my walk. It was exhilarating to be here on this western shore, looking to the east, finally starting my adventure. I had planned, prayed, prepared food, studied maps, and cached supplies and water in key locations for months. I had worked hard to be debt free and to save my money to travel. I purchased a pack, camping equipment, a laptop and digital camera. I had mapped my route and made lists and more lists, lots of lists. I would need lists of gear and equipment list of mileage between supply caches, contacts of people to seek out along the way, and list of local dial-up numbers I could get online as I traveled across the United States. Because back in 1999, high-speed internet was hardly available. Dial-up was the way to surf the net. And there were only two nationwide internet service providers at the time. And thanks to a generous sponsor, I was using Prodigy. I was ready. Yet to say that I wasn't a little anxious, well, that would be a fib. Who would I meet? And what adventures lay waiting on the other side of this beach? What would my new life be? Had I prepared enough? Had I planned enough? Had I made enough lists? What would I learn about this nation and its people? Would it be better than what the 24-hour news cycle reported? And of myself? Would this challenge of my medal prove to be too much? Did I have what it takes to make it to Maine? I walked down to the water and the waves crashed around my feet. Resolutely, I stared east towards the rising sun. The feelings I had at this moment reminded me of a line from one of my favorite movies. A line that is spoken by Red in the Shawshank Redemption when he is free from prison and about to begin his journey to find his friend Andy. I find I'm so excited that I can barely sit still or hold a thought in my head. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I asked the Lord for safety and protection and I felt with all my heart that I would make it to my destination. I just had no idea how long it would take or how much I would be changed by the journey's conclusion. I asked a passing gentleman on the beach to take a picture to mark the occasion. And then with the first step in the Pacific, I began. However, this first step out of the ocean in the shadow of the Scripps Pier really wasn't the beginning. It had started many months ago. And the fact that I was embarking on a hike across America was pretty grand, but that I could walk at all. Now that was truly amazing.
October of 1998. I was less than a year from starting my little hike. The movie Ants had been in the top of the box office for a couple of weeks, but that soon would be topped by a bug's life. Astronaut John Glenn, who had been the first American to orbit the Earth, was about to become the oldest person in space at 77 years young. It would be another 23 years until October 2021 when Captain Kirk, I mean William Shatner, would top it at age 90. As for myself, I had been planning the trip for several months. A month prior, I had actually driven the route from California to Marble Falls, Texas, taking careful and copious notes about what lay ahead. But now, I was back in Southern California with my unit. We were stationed at Marine Corps Air Station El Toro, long since closed, as it was on the BRAC list, short for Base Realignment and Closure, a decision made four years before I would even be stationed at El Toro in 1996. The BRAC was a program to realign military assets in the wake of the Cold War. We were deployed in an approximately 2,000 square mile area of Southern California and Arizona, conducting what was the largest operation our unit had engaged in since the first Gulf War. My job in the Corps was data communications. Basically, I was a buff nerd. I was part of a small team of other buff nerds. Like many other small teams, we had set up local area networks or LANs that were part of a much larger WAN or wide area network, all connected via microwave and satellite communications. Important logistics traffic and information passed through our data networks. My team was temporarily located at the headquarters building for Marine Air Support Squadron 3 at the 32 area of Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, about an hour north of San Diego. In this building, we were given a small utility room to set up all of our data communications equipment. Honestly, to compare this room to a cramped, stuffy, dingy little broom closet, well, my friends, this would be a disservice to dingy little broom closets everywhere. Okay, so it was a little bigger than a broom closet, but not by much. And the room didn't have any sort of ventilation. We set up all of our equipment and went online with the rest of our unit. This proved satisfactory as long as we were using non-secure communications. However, as soon as we switched to secure communications, all of our networks stopped talking to one another. Keep in mind that this was in the late 90s, so software and hardware have changed dramatically. Either way, the important thing, we couldn't communicate. This was a big deal. A big deal because Marines were conducting live fire with artillery, tanks, fixed wing, and rotary wing. They relied on effective and secure communication to accomplish their jobs safely. A basic Marine philosophy in approaching warfare is to engage, respond, and project. The Marine Air Ground Task Force, or MAGTAF, a temporary construct as the mission determines is where the rubber meets the road, philosophically speaking. The objective of this MAGTAF was to keep a continual stream of bombardment upon the target, perfectly coordinated between all the elements listed above. The communications element of this group was crucial. For four days straight, we were up continuously, around the clock. We had to resolve these communications issues. Finally, on the fifth day, success. Having established secure communications, we were granted permission to get the rest we desperately needed. I, being a country boy, chose to sleep outside the back door of this building because the thought of one more moment in this dingy, stuffy, little broom closet, well, it was too much. The weather outside was amazing and the night air crisp and cool. This night, I would sleep under the stars. A little bit about the 32 area. The headquarters building was one of several buildings within a compound behind a fence with gate guards. I think that the extra security was just for this training operation, as I don't believe that the gates and guards or fences typically surrounded this facility. If memory serves, the main entrance to this compound was to the southeast the headquarters building being oriented to the southwest, with a large parking lot to the front and right side of the building. 
A small paved area to the left side and to the rear of the building was separated from the southwest parking lot by a median landscaped with small shrubs and flowers. That median ran directly from the building's front to the northwest to a grassy berm that ran north-south. It was about 15 yards from the left side of the headquarters building. There were three or four small conics boxes just inside of the berm in that small paved area, making the space even smaller. On the other side of the berm was a north-south paved road that went to the crest of the hill where large air traffic radar stood, rotating continuously. Down the hill to the south were the motor pool, armory, and a couple of other buildings, along with another gated access to the compound. The only way to access the small paved area to the left of the headquarters building was a narrow driveway to the north connected to the road on the other side of the berm. We had been the only ones to drive in the small paved lot to the left of the building the whole week. It wasn't a road and we would generally park our Humvee here next to the door to access our little broom closet data center. This night, we parked our Humvee in the main parking lot. They didn't generally want tactical vehicles in the main parking during regular working hours. But I think someone had made a snack run and return after the other gate was closed. So on this night, I threw my sleeping bag down, parallel to the building, by the back door underneath a large light just so that no one would trip over me. Despite lying directly on the asphalt, I immediately slipped into the deepest slumber, and it was excellent. Everything right with the world. You know, as excellent as it can be sleeping on the pavement. It just shows how low the bar is the more exhausted you are. Excruciating pain shot through my legs. I was disoriented by the roar of a large diesel engine. My eyes strained to see a massive bumper directly over my head as a Marine Corps 5 ton was crushing my legs. My first thought, they ran over me. I can't believe they ran over me. The next, Jason, you can forget about walking across the United States. You, you will never walk again. It was 530 in the morning, so it was still very dark outside. A group of Marines bound for the rifle range had taken a shortcut through the small paved lot between the row of Connex boxes and the left side of the HQ building. They cut hard and fast, almost hitting the building with the front bumper. The front tire, driver's side of the 5-ton, we call them 5-tons because they are rated to carry 5 tons worth of cargo. Actually, they weigh in excess of 8.5 tons, ran over both my legs, with the double axle or double tires just missing my feet. In the course of the night, I had shifted in my sleep and was now perpendicular to the building with my head against the wall. The width of the tires was the exact length of my shins. An inch higher or an inch lower, I would have had crushed knees or ankles. You have to keep in mind I hadn't slept in four days, so I was out. I never heard the truck as it roared into the back lot. In the instant that it hit my legs, I was completely relaxed. In a split second, the tire began rolling over my legs. I tensed up at the pain and shock. While my right leg was relaxed, my left leg tensed and thereby received more damage. The truck continued, and just as it was jumping the median, you know, the one that had the shrubs and flowers in it, I heard a Marine in the back exclaim, Hey, I think we ran over somebody or something. By this point, I had jerked myself up as the truck passed. And I must have been in shock because I didn't yell out. I watched them drive on as I tried in vain to unzip my sleeping bag. The truck never stopped. Just as the driver never saw me, he also couldn't hear the guy in the back. Later in the investigation that followed, I would find out that my sitting up so quickly after the accident made the Marine, who had exclaimed that we hit someone, think that I must have been okay and just let the incident go. I sat there knowing I had to get help, wondering how bad the damage was. My legs were on fire. Every time my heart beat, my legs throbbed. It felt as though a thousand needles stabbed them all at once. Sort of like when you let an extremity fall asleep, only much more intense. They felt hot and wet, as though they were oozing blood. The pain in my right leg convinced me that my tibula and fibula were broken. My left leg felt as though it was crushed, and the bones pulverized. 
I did not try to stand, assuming my legs would not support me. I unzipped my sleeping bag, which now had tire tread marks on it, and the asphalt that I had been lying on had rubber tread marks, except for where my bag had been. I only know this because of the pictures the investigator took afterward. I dragged myself to the door, just a few feet away, and fumbled with it until it opened. I bellowed down the dark hallway for my friend, Sergeant Raymond Seahawk. As I crawled down the hallway, I felt surely I was leaving a trail of blood. I strained back to check, but no dark trails behind me. I thought, this has to be a good sign. Again, I yelled for Ray at the top of my lungs. Another 30 feet down the hall and to the right contained our little broom closet data center. Several times, I screamed for Ray with all the energy I could muster as I continued dragging my useless legs behind me. Finally, I reached our room. Here, the feeling I was in a bad dream was compounded not just for myself, but also for Ray. I pushed the old wooden door ajar, and it creaked like a door in a horror movie. On the floor in the center of the room was Ray, ever so peacefully asleep illuminated by the fluorescent light from the hall. The rest of the room, a dark cavern. Just as I had been awake for four days, so had Ray. And as I had not heard the truck, Ray had not heard me shouting his name. Ray! I yowled as loud as I could. What? Ray roared, startled from his slumber. I got run over by a five ton, I managed through the pain. What? said Ray, utter shock and terror in his eyes. I got ran over by a five ton. I had only managed to crawl to the door and push it open. All Ray could see was my talking head on the floor, with the rest of my body blocked by the wall. He jumped into action and rushed to me. I could see on his face that he wasn't sure what he would see once he got into the hallway. He got to me and quickly glanced down, assuring himself that all of me was there and there wasn't entrails hanging out, and that my legs appeared to be intact. I'll get help, he exclaimed, and raced down the hall to where the duty, staff, non-commissioned officer on call was located. Within 15 or 20 minutes, the ambulance was there. I was taken to the base hospital. My legs were black and blue and had swollen to three times the normal size. I had suffered massive contusions. They took x-rays to determine the extent of my injuries. They poked and prodded me to assess the level of damage. Miraculously, there was no broken bones. However, I had this one Navy lieutenant who would not leave me alone about a urine sample. It was standard procedure to test my urine to make sure I wasn't on any drugs during the accident. But I didn't need to go. So she left me with a collection bottle that I could, you know, fill right there in my bed. Here's the thing, though. You spend your whole life training your body not to go when you're lying down. If you go when you're lying down, well, this means you're probably asleep and dreaming. And then, well, you have a lot more embarrassing issues going on. She kept coming back every half hour to collect my sample. I could not force myself sitting there in that bed. I just couldn't. Finally, after a couple hours, she threatened to put a catheter in so she could get her sample. I flat out told her she would not be performing such a procedure on me. At this, she grabbed her lapel to remind me that she was an officer, and I was not. At this point, I did not care. The heck with rank, proper military etiquette, and honors. I would not have a catheter shoved up. Well, you get the idea. I told her I didn't care about rank. This was not going to happen. She left in a huff. Gunnery Sergeant Clark, our platoon staff, non-commissioned officer in charge, had come to see me in the hospital, tried to calm me down. I told him and another doctor that if I could just stand, I could go, but I could not go here in this bed. They got me a wheelchair and helped me to a nearby restroom, where Gunny had to help me stand while I uh, filled the container. Sorry, Gunny. I managed to get up and walk that day, albeit very slowly, with the aid of a walker. I was determined to walk from the hospital to the vehicle that would take me back to Marine Corps Air Station El Toro and my barracks room. I remember that a colonel, I think the group CO, came to visit me in the barracks that night 
to make sure I was all right and being well taken care of. He and the first sergeant were very keen on my pick of lottery numbers, hoping to cash in on my extreme good fortune. I spent the weekend sleeping knocked out on Vicodin. My kids, they, they love to play a game at the dinner table called telephone. You know, the game where you sit around and you whisper a short phrase into a person's ear next to you, and it's repeated in whispers all around the table until it gets back to you, and everyone finds out how close the final phrase was to the original. I was to find out from my roommate, Corporal Wesley Andrews, who had been on a separate team that week, that the Marine Corps version of telephone was played out this very morning amongst all the other sites. The first call went out that a Marine had been run over that morning by a five-ton and sadly didn't make it. A half hour later, an update. It was Jamar who was ran over. And then another half hour. It was Jamar, and he lived. But he's in the hospital, and it, it doesn't look good. A little later, it was Jamar, and it ran over both of his legs. He will never walk again. Finally, later that afternoon, okay, it was Jamar, it was both of his legs, but he's okay. Nothing was broken. In the investigation that followed that the Marines driving the five-ton lied in their accident report, stating that they had performed a three-point turn in a small lot and that an A-driver had walked in front of the vehicle as to protocol when maneuvering between buildings and small spaces. Clearly, this wasn't the case. Otherwise, they would have seen me under the light next to the door with my head against the building. The pain from getting ran over was more than I had ever encountered. Now, with a few years behind me, I would rank the pain just above kidney stones and just a hair shy of a man cold. The only sign today that anything ever happened is tread marks on my left shin muscle when I flex it and a slight loss of feeling in that area of my leg. I was so thankful that it was not worse. Within two and a half weeks of the accident, I ran a physical fitness test. There is another component to the story. I believe that we are more than just flesh and blood. We are also spirit. I had become a Christian my senior year in high school and had been very excited and motivated about the fact. So much so that some of the guys called me church lady in boot camp. I just laughed and rolled with it. Just before I got ran over, I had come to a spiritual low. I had been running away from God for months. As if you can really get away from God. Wanting to just be accepted by my peers. I could smile and act like everything was fine, yet I was miserable on the inside, and I had gotten very depressed. One of my goals for this trek across the United States was to work on my relationship with God, sort of a monastic trip across the country. I had earnestly prayed the night before, at bedtime, that God do something to bring me back. So I got ran over the following morning. My legs should have been pulverized. Had I been lying in the other direction, I'd been a chalk outline and a grease stain. I believe God spared my legs that morning. I believe he allowed me to take my trip. However, it would be on his terms and not mine. You see, many people think it's incredible that I was able to walk across the country. But I am thankful that I can walk at all. In the Marine Corps, we have a motto, Semper Fidelius, always faithful. Of course, a Marine somewhere with a fine sense of humor had to put a twist on it. For our unofficial secondary motto, Semper Gumby, always flexible. Noting how well Marines overcome, adapt, and multitask, I was not sure I was what they had in mind. But I can tell you my legs definitely felt Gumby after the accident. Surviving the ordeal earned some extra respect for my band of brothers. How best do Marines express their regard, admiration, and general overall esteem for the fellow Marines' miraculous recovery and relative indestructibility. Well, nicknames, of course. Man of Steel, Iron Man, Superman, and everyone's favorite, Speed Bump. I left the beach at Scripps Pier and easily covered eight miles to what had been my home for the last 10 months, Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. I went by and paid a visit to my old platoon and stayed the night in my old barracks room. I'd only been out for about three weeks, so my roommate, Corporal Wesley Andrews, hadn't been assigned a new roommate yet. 
and was happy to let me bunk down for the night. The next day I went to get my reservist ID, then I started from MCAS Miramar and hiked a little over 10 miles to a subway in Poway. I had a good reason to stop at the subway, besides just getting a foot long. My first cache of supplies was waiting for me there. Since camping in the middle of the city was not how I wanted to start the trip, I was able to call a friend for a lift back to Miramar for one more night, and then they would give me a ride back to the same subway in the morning so I could continue where I left off, knowing that the next day I would be able to hike enough miles to be able to camp. And then my trip would start for real. Next time on the Long Journey Podcast. Finally, getting out of the city and closer to the Pacific Crest Trail. The trip now underway gets a lot tougher than I had imagined. Plus, the extensive details of prepping and motivation for backpacking across the United States. You can find out more details about the Long Journey Podcast at journeylong.com. And be sure to join my newsletter. And may you journey long.